Hi, my name is Laura Brayman Hassan. I'm a global child protection expert based in Washington, DC. I'm also currently the director of international programs for the Chesterton Society, expanding access to classical education to children in fragile emergency and other international contexts. It's my pleasure and privilege to be here with you today as a part of the Harvard Human Flourishing Program's Global Symposium on Faith and Flourishing, Addressing Child Sexual Abuse. I'm going to be speaking specifically today about child marriage as a form of child sexual abuse, and I'll be speaking from a uniquely Christian and Catholic perspective about what I think my religious community can do on a more systemic level to address and stop child marriage. But I'm hopeful that my remarks will be of interest and germane to the work of people from a range of belief and religious backgrounds so that we can all work together in addressing child marriage both in the civil forum and in our respective religious communities. Before I start, I would like to thank the University of Notre Dame, who published a long-form essay uh, from which these remarks are largely drawn. That's the Church Life Journal, September 2020. So please uh, look online for that essay if you'd like to have more information about child marriage, Catholicism, and canon law. Okay, and of course, welcome to my home, the more intimate spot in these virtual days. Child marriage endures as a civil observance a tribal tradition and a religious right spanning all major global religions. Child marriage is defined as a union in which one or more parties are under the age of 18 and therefore children who are unable to give free and full consent. It's not unusual for child marriage to unite girls as young as 10 or 12 with men decades older than them. Although marriages are often brokered between girls and boys. And global estimates find that about 20% of girls and 3% of boys are married as children, leading around 12 million girls to marry every year. In its more devious forms, child marriage can facilitate a grave range of child sexual abuse, disguising sex trafficking schemes and fostering greater incidences of marital violence, including statutory rape, marital rape, and physical abuse. In some cultures, adult rapists are still allowed to marry their child rape victims, and in so doing, perversely mollify religious or cultural expectations regarding sexual activity out of wedlock. Child marriage is often followed by pregnancy, which can put girls' adolescent bodies at greater risk of obstetric fistula or even death. Marriage often ends girls' formal education, perpetuating cycles of illiteracy that can endanger her health and the health of her children. Boys too are frequently required to drop out of school at marriage so, so that they can begin working full time, often in insecure, low wage jobs that entrench them and their families in poverty. Child marriage can be a response to financial need and food insecurity. Families may use it to stem adolescents' real or perceived extramarital, extramarital sexual behavior or to try to protect girls from sexual predators. Major environmental, political, and economic crises, such as South Asia's cyclical cyclones, the Syrian and Rohingya refugee crisis, crises, and COVID-19's social and economic fallout can all intensify these pressures. But many families choose child marriage as a matter of honor and tradition, and underlying cultural norms regarding gender, the ascent from childhood to adulthood, and the nature of marriage predispose a family, in crisis or not, to groom their children for marriage. For many children, tribal or cultural rites of passage are key to marking their ascent from childhood to adulthood. These rites often fall concurrent to puberty and come with attendant expectations of swift marriage and procreation, reflecting beliefs that adulthood is defined by biology and that marriage and parenthood validate biological adulthood. Religious faith plays a significant role in shaping gender, ascent, and marriage norms as well. Although syncretisms between, syncretism between local tribal religions and major global religions, such as Christianity and Islam, can make it difficult to parse distinct streams of influence. Regardless, religious leaders of all faiths remain influential child marriage gatekeepers per their power to enforce gender and ascent norms and their authority to officiate marriages. In the civil forum, the United Nations and Western governments urge countries to ratify child marriage convention, conventions and adopt laws setting marriage age at 18. Still, many countries and provinces, and indeed many parts of the United States still today, may set marriage age as low as 10, pardon me, may set marriage age as low as 12 or 14. 
In both the West and the majority world, it's not uncommon to see conflict between civil laws governing age of marriage, age of majority, age of sexual consent, and statutory rape. In the United States, to hear a justice center unchained at last and students against child marriage are doing some of the strongest work to address domestic child marriage issues. In majority world countries where cultural or religious traditions remain robust, often accompanied by enduring tribal or religious juridical structures, civil marriage may be seen as the domain of nation states rooted in colonial structures and bound to neo-colonial global governance schemes. While tribal or religious marriage may be regarded as true marriage, the provenance of ancient cultures whose transcendent roots propelled them to outlive and outlast fleeting nations. Even if a country adopts a marriage age of 18, tribal and religious leaders, often aided by sympathizers in civil bureaucratic, police, and judicial structures, may continue to celebrate or ignore child marriage. The interplay and schisms between civil marriage as governed by civil codes and tribal or religious marriage as governed by cultural or faith traditions highlight the uneasy stalemate often struck between Western change makers, majority world leaders, and wary grassroots communities. While child marriage does appear to be decreasing, the fact remains that millions of girls are expected to marry every year in communities where civil laws pale in comparative power to religious and cultural norms. Significantly, the 20 countries with the highest child rates of child marriage for girls are highly religious countries, 11 of which are predominantly Christian and eight of which are predominantly Muslim. The 20 countries with the highest rates of child marriage for boys are similarly religious, and 14 of these countries are predominantly Christian, while four are predominantly Muslim. According to the Pew Templeton Global Religious Futures Project, of the Christian countries in the top ranks for child marriage rates among both boys and girls, the narrow majority are predominantly Catholic, and I think that this may be a useful lever in addressing global child marriage rates. Catholicism maintains a robust and coherent juridical structure with a code of canon law valid across the globe, mediated by a system of ecclesiastical courts beholden to national bishops and ultimately to the Holy See. While interpretation and application of canon law may vary between jurisdictions, it remains a brooding present standard queried especially in matters pertaining to Catholicism's seven sacraments, of which one is marriage. Canon law's mar marriage age remains surprisingly low. Canon 1083 sets it at 16 years of age for boys and 14 years of age for girls. This standard was most recently revised over 100 years ago in 1917, when the 1917 Code of Canon Law, Canon 1067, changed a longstanding law allowing both sexes to marry at 12 years of age. The church had an opportunity to reconsider marriage age when preparing the 1983 Code of Canon Law, but chose to retain the 1917 standards and add only a provision allowing local bishops to raise marriage age as appropriate to local customs. In an effort to address child marriage as a form of child sexual abuse and as a facilitator of other forms of violence against children, Catholic, child, Catholic Church Canon Law marriage age should be raised from 16 years of age for boys and 14 years of age for girls to 18 years of age for all. This change would reflect Catholic belief that human maturity encompasses not only the biological development of the body, but also the personalist development of the spirit and the soul. This change would rightly acknowledge the pivotal connection between puberty and ascent to adulthood and the reality that biological capacity to create new life is a unique marker of human maturity. It would affirm the biological reality that by 18 years of age, the vast majority of young people have attained a sexual maturity and are biologically capable of procreation without the heightened health risks younger girls may face. And by this age, young people with consistent access to school are often able to complete both primary and secondary education or a combination of academic and, pr and practical work experience, giving them a more solid foundation for the responsibilities of adulthood, including for many, nurturing, providing for, and educating their own children. The change would harmonize canon law marriage age with canon law age of majority, 
which is currently stands at 18, the age at which a person is no longer subject to the authority of parents or guardians. 18 years of age would stand as a practical and theologically sound terminal at which young people, parents, and the church might draw on St. Pope John Paul II's theology of the body and appraise an adolescent's ascent to spiritual, emotional, and mental capacities of maturity, including those noted by John Paul II, including self-dominion, self-gift, and self-entrustment abilities which must be piqued so that a young person may wisely discern and enter into a vocation of marriage, priesthood, or religious orders. Defining a confluence between marriage age and age of majority would also emphasize the significance of Canon 1114's free consent requirement and so help to subvert child, child sex trafficking schemes and child rape norms operating under the guise of child marriage. In less devious instances, it would also encourage pastors and communities to more readily deter or delay marriages in which there is one party, often a bride who is significantly younger than a groom, who may not have the maturity or confidence to challenge a well-intentioned betrothal. Finally, this change would position the Catholic Church to engage coherently in growing discussions regarding civil protections in, for children provided in consent and statutory rape laws laws which are currently under discussion by a wide range of civil actors. And in the spirit of Pope Francis's encyclical Fratelli Tutti, this change would prepare Catholics to partner fraternally with Muslim majority countries who also have work to do in addressing their own high child marriage rates. Thank you all again for joining me today. Thank you to the leaders and the organizers of the Harvard Human Flourishing Programs Global Symposium on Faith and Flourishing. And thank you as well to my distinguished panelists. I look forward to discussing this and other matters with you in one of today's live chats. And I'll also be happy to continue the conversation afterwards as desired. Thanks again.